So welcome to week seven, where we're going to be discussing work and unemployment. The learning objectives for this week are as follows. We're going to explain how the 2007 U.S. economic crisis affected the global economy, describe differences between capitalism and socialism, and discuss pros and cons of the free trade agreements and transnational corporations. We're also going to give examples how the structural functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism view work on work and the economic institution. We're also going to understand pro problems associated with work in the United States and around the world, including unemployment, slavery, sweatshop labor, child labor, health and safety in the workplace, work-life conflict, alienation, job stress, and issues concerning labor unions and worker rights. We're also going to describe strategies for reducing unemployment and creative alternatives to capitalism through worker cooperatives, ending slavery, child labor, and sweatshop labor, making the workplace safer, safer helping workers achieve work-life balance, and strengthen, strengthening labor unions. And finally, we're going to identify employment-related human rights issues and present examples of how and why the human rights are being violated in workplace around the world. The assignments for this week are to read Chapter 7, which here is the link. Then you're going to have to watch this video that I am recording now and complete the lecture quiz, which you'll find both of them right under the link of your textbook. It's not there yet because I am right now currently making the video. And then finally, you have a written assignment that deals with the problems with work and unemployment. For this assignment, you're going to read chapter 7, and you're going to turn it in and turn it in the link right here below, as usual. And it is worth 25 points. So you must choose one of the problems highlighted in your textbook. They're going to be found in sections 73A through section 73J. And you will write a detailed summary about it, and it has to be 200 words minimum. The vast majority of this assignment must be written in your own words. And if you use the textbook to get a sentence or two, remember that you need to quote that sentence and cite it correctly. So let's get to the PowerPoint. So as I stated, we're going to be discussing Chapter 7, and it deals with work and unemployment. So here is a quote from Rich Hall, um, who is a writer and a performer, and it gives you something to think about. When you go to work, if your name is on the building, you are rich. If your name is on your desk, you are middle class. And if your name is on your shirt, you are poor. So just give you something to think about. So I won't go over the learning objectives because I just did. So let's move on to the chapter outline. So first we're going to discuss the global context, which is the new global economy. And then we're going to move on to sociological theories of work and the economy. Then we're going to discuss the problems of work and unemployment, which this is the section that has to do with your written assignment. And then we'll move on to strategies for action, which are responses to problems of work and unemployment. And finally, we'll talk about an understanding for work and unemployment. So the global context and the new global economy. In recent decades, innovations in communication and information technology have spawned the emergence of a global economy, which is an interconnected network of economic activity that transcends national borders and spans around the world. So think of cell phones and how they're manufactured and how that is part of the global economy. And in 2007, the global financial crisis, which originated in the United States and spread throughout the world, illustrates the, globaliz the globalization of the economic institution. And as we've discussed prior, um, the economy is part of one of the major institutions, and the economic institution is defined as the structure and means by which a society produces, distributes, and consumes goods and services. So capitalism and socialism. Capitalism is what we have here in the United States, and it is an economic system in which private individuals or groups invest in capital to produce goods and services to sell for a profit in a competitive market. Socialism, on the other hand, is an economic system in which the state owns the means of production, which is the factory, machinery, lands, stores, and offices, and oversees the distribution of goods and services. So this is not to be confused with communism. Communism is completely different with socialism. But I bring that up because in social media and in media per se, 
you see a lot of people comparing communism to socialism or saying that socialists are communists, and that is not true. So the globalization of trade and free trade agreements. What are free trade agreements? They are pacts between countries that make it easier to trade goods across national borders. So they reduce foreign restrictions on exports, they reduce taxes on importing goods, and they prevent technology from being copied through intellectual property rights. Transnational corporations. These are corporations that have their home base in one country and branches or affiliates in other countries. Transnational corporations contribute to the trade deficit, the budget deficit, unemployment in the United States, and they also contribute to poverty, urban decline, and racial and ethnic tensions. You're going to see a video later talking about the Chinese workers, and you're going to see how a transnational cor corporations contribute to poverty, urban decline, and racial and ethnic tensions. So before we get into the sociological theories of work and economy, let's view a few videos on globalization, the theories of globalizations, and the economic system, um, such as uh, socialism and capitalism. So first we'll start off with the global stratification and poverty. You've heard of first world problems, right? Someone cracks the screen on their iPhone or gets the wrong order at Starbucks and they go on Twitter and complain about their hashtag first world problem. So you've heard the phrase, but have you thought about the implications of talking about countries as first or third? Where do these names even come from? These terms are outdated, inaccurate, and frankly insulting ways of talking about global stratification. So how should we talk about global stratification? First, let's deconstruct the idea of the first, second, third world hierarchy, see where it came from, and learn what its implications are. The terms date back to the Cold War, when Western policymakers began talking about the world as three distinct political and economic blocks. Western capitalist countries were labeled as the first world. The Soviet Union and its allies were termed the second world, and then everyone else got grouped into third world. After the Cold War ended, the category of second world countries became null and void, but somehow the terms first world and third world stuck around in the public consciousness. Third world countries, which started as just a vague catch-all for non-aligned countries, came to be associated with impoverished states, while first world was associated with rich, industrialized countries. But in addition to being seriously outdated, these terms are also inaccurate. There are more than a hundred countries that fit the label of third world, but they have vastly different levels of economic stability. Some are relatively poor, but many aren't. So lumping Botswana and Rwanda into the same category, for example, doesn't make much sense, because the average average income per capita in Botswana is nine times larger than in Rwanda. Nowadays, sociologists sort countries into groups based on their specific levels of economic productivity. To do this, they use the Gross Domestic Product, or GDP, which measures the total output of a country, and the Gross National Income, or GNI, which measures GDP per capita. High-income countries are those with GNI above $12,500 per year. There are 79 countries in this group, including the US, the UK, Germany, Chile, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, and more. As the name suggests, standards of living are higher here than the rest of the world. High-income countries are also highly urbanized, with 81% of people in high-income countries living in or near cities. Much of the world's industry is centered in these countries too, and with industry comes money and technology. Take cell phones, for example. 60% of those in low-income countries have a cell phone. But in high-income countries, not only does almost everyone have a cell phone, but for every 100 people in high-income countries, there are 124 cell phone plans. The next category is the upper middle income countries, defined as those with GNI between $4,000 and $12,500 per year. There are 56 countries in this group, and they tend to have advancing economies with both manufacturing and high-tech markets, such as China, Mexico, Russia, and Argentina. They're also heavily urban, have access to public infrastructure like education and health, and have comfortable standards of living for most citizens, not too different from what you'd expect in a high-income country. Now, you might notice that I keep talking about how urban these types of countries are. Why does it matter how many people live in cities? Well, if you're used to media depictions of poverty in the U.S., you might think of it as an inner-city problem, but poverty worldwide is mostly rural. 
agricultural societies produce less than industrialized ones. Which brings us to our next grouping, lower middle income countries. These have GNI between $1,000 and $4,000 per year, and they include such countries as Ukraine, India, Guatemala, and Zambia. Unlike the previous groups, only 40% of people living in lower middle income countries live in urban areas, and the economy is based around manufacturing and natural resource production. Here, access to services like quality health care and education is limited to those who are well off. For example, the maternal mortality rate is five times higher in lower middle income countries than in upper middle income countries, and one third of children under the age of five are malnourished. Our final grouping includes the 31 countries designated as low income, which have yearly GNI less than $1,000 per year. These countries are primarily rural. Most of the world's farmers live in these countries, and their economies are mainly based on agriculture. Not only do these countries face income poverty, they also have greater rates of disease, worse healthcare and education systems, and many of their citizens lack access to basic needs like food and clean water. Here, 8% of children die before the age of 5, and among older children, more than one-third never finish primary school. This type of poverty is very different than the type of poverty that we see in high-income countries like the United States. That's why when we talk about social stratification on a global level, it's important to remember the distinctions between relative and absolute poverty. Relative poverty exists in all societies regardless of the overall income level of the society, but absolute poverty is when a lack of resources is is literally life-threatening. Let's go to the Thought Bubble to talk about two groups that are particularly vulnerable in low-income countries, children and women. The results of child poverty range from malnutrition to homelessness to children working in dangerous and illegal jobs. UNICEF estimates that there are 18.5 million children worldwide who are orphans, and an estimated 150 million are engaged in child labor. Child malnutrition is worst in South Asia and Africa, where one-third of children are affected, and half of all child deaths worldwide are attributed to hunger. Women also make up a disproportionate number of the globally poor. 70% of those living at or below absolute poverty levels worldwide are women. Some of this is a result of women being kept from working due to religious or cultural beliefs. Some of it is because many women who do work don't get to control the fruits of their labor. Quite literally, even though women in low-income countries produce 70% of the food, men own the land that the women's labor is done on. 90% of the land in poor countries is owned by men. And the poverty of children and the poverty of women are connected, specifically by reproductive health care. Poor access to reproductive health care is part of the reason that birth rates are so much higher in low-income countries. And less money plus more mouths to feed equals more child poverty. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Women and children may be the most vulnerable to global poverty, but poor societies have many problems beyond malnutrition and poor health care, including slavery. You might think of slavery as a problem from long ago. I mean, the U.S. was slow to abolish slavery compared to other Western countries. But slavery is very much alive around the world. The International Labor Organization estimates that there are at least 20 million men, women, and children currently enslaved. Now, all of these symptoms of global poverty might make you think, what causes it? One likely cause is simply the lack of access to technology, and I'm not talking about like self-driving cars. Being able to use simple things like fertilizer and modern seeds, for example, can make huge differences for families in low-income countries. Also, cell phones. The growing number of cell phones in sub-Saharan Africa has increased access to educational tools, banking services, and healthcare resources. Another major cause of global inequalities is population growth. Even with the higher death rates, the high birth rates in lower income countries mean that the populations in poor countries double every 25 years, further straining those countries' economic resources. And this is directly related to a third reason for global poverty, gender inequalities. The same cultural and social factors that prevent women from working also tend to limit their access to birth control, which in turn increases family sizes, and that contributes to population growth and slows economic development as resources become strained. Social and economic stratification both within countries and across countries are also part of the story. Unequal distribution of wealth within a country makes it hard for those stuck in poverty to get out of poverty. And inequality across nations means that countries with more economic power have historically been able to subjugate less powerful nations through systems like colonialism. Colonialism is the process by which some nations enrich themselves by taking political and economic control of other nations. Western Europe colonized much of Latin America, Africa, and Asia starting more than 500 years ago, and as a result, much of the wealth and resources flowed out of those regions and into European coffers. And colonialism isn't some distant past. Most African British colonies gained their independence in 1968. In other words, the baby boomers that you know were alive when the UK still had colonies. So it's no wonder that so many colonized countries remain low or lower middle income when they've only had a little over half a century to begin building their own independent countries. And as colonialism fell, new power relationships emerged that have made it harder for poor countries to develop further. 
further. Neocolonialism doesn't involve direct political control of a nation. Instead, it involves economic exploitation by corporations, for example. Corporate leaders often exert economic pressure on lower-income countries to allow them to operate under business conditions that are favorable for the companies and often unfavorable for the citizens that work for them. This is all difficult stuff to talk about, but there is good news. Global poverty is getting better. Life expectancy is improving rapidly in low-income countries. Between 1990 and 2012, life expectancy in low-income countries has increased by nine years, and child mortality rates have worldwide in the same period. How do we keep up this progress? If we want to tackle global poverty, addressing the social, cultural, and economic forces that keep countries mired in poverty will be the first step. Today we discuss the terms first and third world countries and the reasons why those terms are no longer used. We also went over four types of countries high income, upper middle income, lower middle income, and low income countries, and the lifestyles of people within those countries. We talked about some of the consequences of global poverty, including malnutrition, poor education, overpopulation partially due to poor reproductive health care, and slavery. Finally, we discussed some explanations for global poverty, including technology, gender inequality, social stratification, and global power relationships like colonialism. Next week, we'll discuss the main theories behind global stratification. Crash Course Sociology is filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney studio in Missoula, Montana, and it's made with the help of all of these nice people. Our animation... So now we're going to move on to this video that deals with theories of global stratification. For much of human history, all of the societies on Earth were poor. Poverty was the norm for everyone. But obviously, that's not the case anymore. Just as you find stratification among socioeconomic classes within a society like the United States, across the world, you also see a pattern of global stratification, with inequalities in wealth and power between societies. So what made some parts of the world develop faster, economically speaking, than others? How you explain the differences in socioeconomic status among the world's societies depends, of course, on which paradigm you're using to view the world. One of the two main explanations for global stratification is modernization theory, and it comes from the structural functionalist approach. This theory frames global stratification as a function of technological and cultural differences between nations, and it specifically pinpoints two historical events that contributed to Western Europe developing at a faster rate than much of the rest of the world. The first event is known as the Columbian Exchange. This refers to the spread of goods, technology, education, and diseases between the Americas and Europe after Columbus's so-called discovery of the Americas. And if you want to learn more about that, we did a whole world history episode about it. This exchange worked out pretty well for the European countries. They gained agricultural staples like potatoes and tomatoes, which contributed to population growth and provided new opportunities for trade, while also strengthening the power of the merchant class. But the Columbian Exchange worked out much less well for Native Americans, whose populations were ravaged by the diseases brought from Europe. It's estimated that in the 150 years following Columbus's first trip, over 80% of the Native American population died due to diseases such as smallpox and measles. The second historical event is the Industrial Revolution in the 18th and 19th century. We've mentioned this before, and there are a couple world history episodes that you can check out for more detail, but this is when new technologies like steam power and mechanization allowed countries to replace human labor with machines and increase productivity. The Industrial Revolution at first only benefited the wealthy in Western countries, but industrial technology was so productive that it gradually began to improve standards of living for everyone. Countries that industrialized in the 18th and 19th century saw massive improvements in their standards of living, and countries that didn't industrialize lagged behind. The thing to note here is that modernization theory rests on the idea that affluence could have happened to anyone, but of course it didn't. So why didn't the Industrial Revolution take hold everywhere? Well, modernization theory argues that the tension between tradition and technological change is the biggest barrier to growth. A society that's more steeped in family systems and traditions may be less willing to adopt new technologies and the new social systems that often accompany them. Why did Europe modernize? The answer goes back to Max Weber's ideas about the Protestant work ethic. The Protestant Reformation primed Europe to take on a progress-oriented way of life in which financial success was a sign of personal virtue, and individualism replaced communalism. 
This is the perfect breeding ground for modernization. And according to American economist Walt Rostow, modernization in the West took place, as it always tends to, in four stages. First, the traditional stage refers to societies that are structured around small local communities, with production typically getting done in family settings. Because these societies have limited resources and technology, most of their time is spent laboring to produce food, which creates a strict social hierarchy. Think feudal Europe or early Chinese dynasties. Tradition rules how a society functions. What your parents do is what their parents did and what you'll do when you grow up too. But as people begin to move beyond doing what's always been done, a society moves into Rostow's second stage, the takeoff stage. Here, people begin to use their individual talents to produce things beyond the necessities, and this innovation creates new markets for trade. In turn, greater individualism takes hold, and social status is more closely linked with material wealth. Next, nations begin what Rostow called the drive to technological maturity, in which technological growth of the earlier periods begins to bear fruit in the form of population growth, reductions in absolute poverty levels, and more diverse job opportunities. Nations in this phase typically begin to push for social change along with economic change, like implementing basic schooling for everyone and developing more democratic political systems. The last stage is known as high mass consumption, when your country is big enough that production becomes more about wants than needs. Many of these countries put social support systems in place to ensure that all of their citizens have access to basic necessities. So the TLDR version of modernization theory is that if you invest capital in better technologies, they'll eventually raise production enough that there will be more wealth to go around and overall well-being will go up. And rich countries can help other countries that are still growing by exporting their technologies and things like agriculture, machinery, and information technology, as well as providing foreign aid. But critics of modernization theory argue that in many ways it's just a new name for the idea that capitalism is the only way for a country to develop. These critics point out that even as technology has improved throughout the world, a lot of countries have been left behind. And they argue that modernization theory sweeps a lot of historical factors under the rug when it explains European and North American progress. Countries like the US and the UK industrialized from a position of global strength during a period when there were no laws against slavery or concerns about natural resource depletion. And some critics also point out that Rostow's markers are inherently Eurocentric, putting an emphasis on economic progress. But that isn't necessarily the only standard to aspire to. After all, economic progress often includes downsides like the environmental damage done by industrialization and the exploitation of cheap or free labor. Finally, critics of modern modernization theory also see it as blaming the victim. In this view, the theory essentially blames poor countries for not being willing to accept change, putting the fault on their cultural values and traditions, rather than acknowledging that outside forces might be holding back those countries. This is where the second theory of global stratification comes in. Rather than focusing on what poor countries are doing wrong, dependency theory focuses on how poor countries have been wronged by richer nations. This model stems from the paradigm of conflict theory, and it argues that the prospects of both wealthy and poor countries are inextricably linked. This theory argues that in a world of finite resources, we can't understand why rich nations are rich without realizing that those riches came at the expense of another country being poor. In this view, global stratification starts with colonialism, and it's where we'll start today's thought bubble. Starting in the 1500s, European explorers spread throughout the Americas. Africa, and Asia, claiming lands for Europe. At one point, Great Britain's empire covered about one-fourth of the world. The United States, which began as colonies themselves, soon sprawled out through North America and took control of Haiti, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, the Hawaiian Islands, and parts of Panama and Cuba. With colonialism came exploitation of both natural and human resources. The transatlantic slave trade followed a triangular route between Africa, the American and Caribbean colonies, and Europe. Guns and factory-made goods were sent to Africa in exchange for slaves, who were sent to the colonies to produce goods like cotton and tobacco, which were then sent back to Europe. As the slave trade died down in the mid-19th century, the point of colonialism came to be less about human resources and more about natural resources, but the colonial model kept going strong. In 1870, only 10% of Africa was colonized. By 1940, only Ethiopia and Liberia were not colonized. Under colonial regimes, European countries took control of land and raw materials to funnel wealth back to the West. Most colonies lasted until the 1960s, and the last British colony, Hong Kong, was finally granted independence in 1997. Thanks, Thought Bubble. 
This history of colonialization is what inspired American sociologist Emanuel Wallerstein's model of what he called the capitalist world economy. Wallerstein described high-income nations as the core of the world economy. This core is the manufacturing base of the planet, where resources funnel in to become the technology and wealth enjoyed by the Western world today. Low-income countries, meanwhile, are what Wallerstein called the periphery, whose natural resources and labor support the wealthier countries, first as colonies and now by working for multinational corporations under neocolonial. Middle-income countries such as India or Brazil are considered the semi-periphery due to their closer ties to the global economic core. In Wallerstein's model, the periphery remains economically dependent on the core in a number of ways which tend to reinforce each other. First, poor nations tend to have few resources to export to rich countries, but corporations can buy these raw materials cheaply and then process and sell them in richer nations. As a result, the profits tend to bypass the poor countries. Poor countries are also more likely to lack industrial capacity, so they have to import expensive manufactured goods from richer nations. And all of these unequal trade patterns lead to poor nations owing lots of money to richer nations, creating debt that makes it hard to invest in their own development. So under dependency theory, the problem is not that there isn't enough global wealth, it's that we don't distribute it well. But just as modernization theory had its critics, so does dependency theory. Critics argue that the world economy isn't a zero-sum game. One country getting richer doesn't mean other countries get poorer, and innovation and technological growth can spill over to other countries, improving all nations' well-being, not just the rich. Also, colonialism certainly left scars, but it isn't enough on its own to explain today's economic disparities. Some of the poorest countries in Africa, like Ethiopia, were never colonized and had very little contact with richer nations. Likewise, some former colonies, like Singapore and Sri Lanka, now have flourishing economies. In direct contrast to what dependency theory predicts, most evidence suggests that nowadays foreign investment by richer nations helps, not hurts, poorer countries. Dependency theory is also very narrowly focused. It points the finger at the capitalist market system as the sole cause of stratification, ignoring the role that things like culture and political regimes play in impoverishing countries. There's also no solution to global poverty that comes out of dependency theory. Most dependency theorists just urge poor nations to cease all contact with rich nations or argue for a kind of global socialism. But these ideas don't acknowledge the reality of the modern world economy, making them not very useful for combating the very real, very pressing problem of global poverty. The growth of the world economy and expansion of world trade has coincided with rising standards of living worldwide, with even the poorest nations almost tripling in the last century. But with increased trade between countries, Trade agreements such as the North American Free Trade Agreement have become a major point of debate, pitting the benefits of free trade against the cost to jobs within a country's borders. Questions about how to deal with global stratification are certainly far from settled, but I can leave you with some good news. It's getting better. The share of people globally living on less than $1.25 per day has more than halved since 1981, going from 52% to 22% as of 2008. Today we learned about two theories of global stratification. First, we discussed modernization theory and Walt Rostow's four stages of modernization. We then talked about dependency theory, the legacy of colonialism, and Emmanuel Wallerstein's capitalist world economy model. Crash Course Sociology is filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney studio in Missoula, Montana, and it's made with the help of all... So there's one more video that I want to show here, and this is the economic system and the labor market. A social institution that has one of the biggest impacts on society is the economy. And you might think of the economy in terms of numbers, unemployment numbers, GDPs, or whatever the stock market is doing today. But while we often talk about it in numerical terms, the economy is really made of people. It's the social institution that organizes all production, consumption, and trade of goods in a society. And there are lots of different ways in which stuff can be made, exchanged, and used. Think capitalism or socialism. These economic systems and the economic revolutions that created them shape the way that people live their lives. Economies can vary a lot from one society to the next, but in any given economy, you can typically see production split into three sectors. The primary sector extracts raw materials from natural environments, so workers like farmers or miners would fit well here. The secondary sector takes raw materials and transforms them into manufactured goods, so someone in the primary sector may extract oil from the earth, but someone in the secondary sector refines the petroleum into gasoline. And then the tertiary sector is the part of the economy that involves services rather than 
goods, you know, doing things rather than making things. But this system is actually pretty complicated, or at least more sophisticated than the way things used to be for much of human history. So how did we get from a world where people worked to produce just what they needed for their families to one with all these sectors that have to work together? To understand that, we need to back up a little about 12,000 years. The first big economic change was the agrarian revolution. When people first learned how to domesticate plants and animals, it ushered in a new agricultural economy that was much more productive than hunter-gatherer societies were. Farming helped societies build surpluses, which meant that not everyone had to spend their time producing food. This, in turn, led to major developments like permanent settlements, trade networks, and population growth. Now let's go to the thought bubble to discuss the second major economic revolution, the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s. With the rise of industry came new economic tools like steam engines, manufacturing, and mass production. Factories popped up, changing how work functioned. Now, instead of working at home, where people worked for their family by making things from start to finish, they began working as wage laborers and becoming more specialized in their skills. Overall productivity went up, standards of living rose, and people had access to a wider variety of goods thanks to mass production. All good things. But every economic revolution comes with economic casualties. The workers in the factories, who were mainly poor women and children, worked in dangerous conditions for low wages. There's a reason that the industrialists of the 19th century were known as robber barons. With more productivity came greater wealth, but also greater economic inequality. So in the late 19th century, labor unions began to form. These organizations of workers sought to improve wages and working conditions through collective action, strikes, and negotiations. Inspired by Marx's principles, labor unions are partly to thank for us now having things like minimum wage laws, reasonable working hours, and regulations to protect the safety of workers. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So, the Industrial Revolution was an incredibly big deal when it came to the changes that it brought to both economies and societies. And there's a third revolution we should talk about, too. One that's happening right now. But before we get to that, we should pause and explore two competing economic models that sprung up around the time of the Industrial Revolution, as economic capital became more and more important to the production of goods. Pretty sure you've heard of them, and possibly have strong opinions about them. They're capitalism and socialism. Capitalism is a system in which all natural resources and means of production are privately owned, and it emphasizes profit-seeking and competition as the main drivers of efficiency. If you own a business, you need to outperform your competitors if you're going to succeed, so you're incentivized to be more efficient by improving the quality of your product and reducing your prices. This is what economist Adam Smith in the 1770s called the invisible hand of the market. The idea is that if you just leave a capitalist economy alone, consumers will regulate things themselves by selecting goods and services that provide the best value. But in practice, an economy doesn't work very well if it's left completely on autopilot. There are lots of sectors where a hands-off approach can lead to what economists call market failures, where an unregulated market ends up allocating goods and services inefficiently. A monopoly, for example, is a kind of market failure. When a company has no competition for customers, it can charge higher prices without worrying about losing customers. That, as economic allocations go, is really inefficient, at least on the consumer end. So in situations like these, a government might step in and force the company to break up into smaller companies to increase competition. Market failures like this are why most countries, the United States included, are not purely capitalist societies. For example, the U.S. federal and state governments own and operate a number of businesses, like schools, the Postal Service, and the military. Governments also set minimum wages, create workplace safety laws, and provide social support programs like unemployment benefits and food stamps. Government plays an even larger role, however, in socialism. In a socialist system, the means of production are under collective ownership. Socialism rejects capitalism's private property and hands-off approaches. Instead, here, property is owned by the government and allocated to all citizens, not just those with the money to afford it. Socialism emphasizes collective goals, expecting everyone to work for the common good, and placing a higher value on meeting everyone's basic needs than on individual profit. When Karl Marx first wrote about socialism, he viewed it as a stepping stone toward communism, a political and economic system in which all members of a society are socially equal. But, of course, in practice, this hasn't played out in the countries that have modeled their economies on socialism, like Cuba, North Korea, China, and the former USSR. Why? Well, Marx hoped that as economic differences vanished in communist society, the government would simply wither away and disappear. But that never happened. If anything, the opposite did. Rather than freeing the proletariat from inequality, the massive power of the government in these states gave enormous wealth, power, and privilege to political elites, retrenching inequalities along political rather than strictly economic lines. At the same time, capitalist countries economically outperformed their socialist counterparts, contributing to the unrest 
that eventually led to the downfall of the USSR. Before the fall of the Soviet Union, the average output in capitalist countries was about $13,500 per person, which was almost three times that in the Soviet countries. But there are downsides to capitalism too, namely greater income inequality. A study of European capitalist countries and socialist countries in the 1970s found that the income ratio between the top 5% and the bottom 5% in capitalist countries was about 10 to 1, whereas in socialist countries it was 5 to 1. We could fill whole episodes about the merits of each economic model, and in fact we did in Crash Course World History. There are many more questions we could answer about how societies build their economic systems. But in any case, those two models aren't the end of the story, because we're living in the middle of the economic revolution that followed the Industrial Revolution. Ours is the time of the information revolution. Technology has reduced the role of human labor and shifted it from a manufacturing-based economy to one based on service work and the production of ideas rather than goods. And this has had a lot of residual effects on our economy. Computers and other technologies are beginning to replace many jobs by making it easier to either automate them or send them offshore. And we've also seen a decline in union membership. Nowadays, most unions are for public sector jobs like teachers. So what do jobs in a post-industrial society look like? Well, agriculture Agricultural jobs, which once were a massive part of the American labor force, have fallen drastically over the last century. While 40% of the labor force was involved in the agricultural sector in 1900, only about 2% of workers today work in farming. Similarly, manufacturing jobs, which were the lifeblood of the U.S. economy for much of the 20th century, have also declined in the last 30 years. So the U.S. economy began with many workers serving in either the primary or secondary economic sectors, but now much of the U.S. economy is centered on the tertiary sector, or the service industry. The service industry makes up 85% of jobs in the U.S., including everything from administrative assistants to nurses to teachers to lawyers to everyone who made this crash course video for you. Now, that's a really big and diverse group. That's because the tertiary sector, like all the economic sectors we've been discussing, is defined mainly by what it produces, rather than what kinds of jobs it includes. So sociologists have a way of distinguishing between types of jobs, based more on the social status and compensation that come with them. There's the primary labor market and the secondary labor market. The primary labor market includes jobs that provide lots of benefits to workers, like high incomes, job security, health insurance, and retirement packages. These are white-collar professions, like doctors or accountants or engineers. Secondary labor market jobs provide fewer benefits and include lower-skilled jobs and lower-level service sector jobs. They tend to pay less, have more unpredictable schedules, and typically don't offer benefits like health insurance. They also tend to have less job security. So what's next for capitalism or socialism? Well, no one knows what the next economic revolution is going to look like. But I can tell you that nowadays, a key part of both our economic and political landscape is corporations. Corporations are defined as organizations that exist as legal entities and have liabilities that are separate from its members, so they're their own thing. And more and more these days, corporations are operating across national boundaries, which means that the future of the U.S. economy, and most countries' economies, will play out on a global scale. Today we discussed how economies can be broken down into the primary, secondary, and tertiary sectors. We discussed the three stages of economic revolution that brought us to the modern post-industrial era, and in the middle there we talked about two types of economic models, capitalism and socialism. Crash Course Sociology is filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney studio in Missoula, Montana, and it's made with the help So, I hope that those three ga videos gave you a, a better understanding on uh, how work has changed, um, the effects of uh, global stratification and globalization and um, poverty. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to contact me. So let's now continue to talk about um, the sociological perspectives, but for this part, I want to use your textbook. So the first perspective is the structural functionalist perspective. And according to this perspective, the economic institution is one of the most important of all social institutions as it functions to provide the basic necessities common to all human societies, including food, clothing, and shelter, and thus contributes to social stability. After the basic survival needs of a society are met, surplus materials and wealth may be allocated to other social uses, such as maintaining military protection from enemies, supporting political and religious leaders, providing formal education, supporting an expanding population, and providing entertainment and recreational activities. Society development is dependent on an economic surplus in a society.
As noted in Chapter 6, the structural functionalist theories Davis and Moore argue that jobs differ in their pay so that workers will be motivated to achieve higher levels of education and training, and that jobs that offer higher rewards are those that are more important and difficult. This argument falls apart when one considers that many very important jobs have a low pay. As discussed in Chapter 6, the inequality associated with salaries and wages is often considered dysfunctional rather than functional for society. The economic institution can also be dysfunctional when it fails to provide members with jobs and the goods and services they need. When the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services depletes and pollutes the environment, when participation in the labor force leads to alienation and work-life um, conflict, and when it includes practice that violates basic human rights such as slavery and unsafe work conditions. The structural functionist perspective also focuses on how the economy affects and is affected by changes in society. So for example, as societies become more economically developed, infant and child death rates drop, women have fewer children, and life expectancy increases, which leads to the aging of the world population. Population aging affects the economy because as the proportion of older people increases, there are fewer working age adults to fill jobs and support the elderly population, which we're going to discuss more in chapter 12. So as far as the conflict perspective, according to the conflict perspective, the ruling class controls the economic system for its own benefit and exploits and oppresses the working masses. The conflict perspective is critical of ways that the government caters to the interest of big business at the expense of workers, consumers, and the public interests. This system of government that serves the interests of corporation, known as corporateocracy, involves ties between government and business. Donald Trump, a wealthy business of himself, chose a vice president and cabinet member who has strong ties to corporate interests. So here in this uh, paragraph, it discusses how Mike Pence is linked to David Koch and how they're all, you know, basically working together and how government and corporations work together. Um, so I'm just going to skip that and go to the next paragraph. The per pervasive influence of corporate power and government exists worldwide. The policies of the International Monetary Fund, which is known as the IMF, and the World Bank pressured developing, developing countries to open their economies to foreign corporations, promoting export production at the expense of local consumption, encouraging, encouraging the exploitation of labor as a means of attracting foreign investment, and hastening the degradation of natural resources as countries sell their forests and minerals to earn money to pay back loans. In the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman, John Perkins described his prior job as an economic hitman, a highly paid professional who would convince leaders of poor countries to accept huge loans, primarily from the World Bank, that they're much bigger, that were much bigger than the country could possibly repay. So, um, in one of the videos, she did speak about how um, uh, lower income countries would take loans from higher income countries. Uh, so they could start doing business there, and um, the fact that they owe that money, uh, just they never can get out of that loan, and thus they couldn't put money into their own country. If you guys remember, she spoke about that. The loans would be used to help develop the country by paying for needed infrastructure, such as roads, electrical paint, plants, airports, shipping ports, and industrial plants. One of the conditions of the loan was that borrowing, the borrowing country had to give 90% of the loan back to U.S. companies to build the infrastructure. The result, the wealthiest families in the country benefit from additional infrastructure, and the poor masses are stuck with a debt they cannot repay. The United States uses this debt as leverage to ask for favors, such as land for the military base or access to national resources, just such as oil. According to Perkins, large corporations want control over the entire world and its resources along with a military that enforces that control. And finally, the symbolic interactionist perspective. According to this perspective, the work role is a central part of a person's self-concept and social identity. When making a new social acquaintance, one of the first questions we usually ask is, what do you do? The answer largely defines for us 
who that person is. An individual occupation is one of the most per is one of the person's most important statuses. For many, it represents a master status, that is the most significant status in a person's social identity. This chapter's um, social problems research close-up features describes a study that looks uh, at how job loss of white collar professionals in midlife affects their self concepts and attitudes about work and unemployment. So when you get a chance, you can read this study here and see what it's all about. And finally, symbolic interaction also focuses on the importance of labors, um, labels. Prior to Donald Trump taking office in 2017, Trump had on numerous occasions labeled uh, official government unemployment figures as phony, total, totally fiction, a complete fraud, fraud and a hoax. Um, pres presumably because he did not want the public to credit Obama with reducing employment. So that last paragraph just deals with how we all know how um, the president likes to label things as fake news or hoax or phony and stuff like that. And though um, unemployment was getting better before the pandemic, of course, um, it's not something that just happened within the past three years. In fact, this is something that this president and the last president had a hand in doing. And Obama did have um, take part a lot in um, reducing the unemployment. Because when you look at the unemployment rate from 2008, when he's first become president, to 2016, when he ended his presidency, the unemployment rate was um, becoming lower and lower and lower with every year that he was president. So the next topic we're going to talk about is problems of work and unemployment. And as you remember, this uh, section has to do with um, your written assignment for this week. So let's go to the PowerPoint for this section. So problems with work and unemployment. Unemployment. To be currently without, this is the definition, by the way. To be currently without employment, actively seeking employment, and available for employment according to the U.S. measures of unemployment. In 2017, more than 200 million people worldwide, about 5.8% of the global labor, labor force, were, were unemployed. The U.S. Uh, unemployment rate rose to 10% in the last quarter of 2009 as companies went out of business and plants closed. A recession refers to a significant decline in economic activity spread across the economy and lasting for at least six months. So what is long, the long-term unemployment rate refers to the share of the unemployed um, who have been out of work for 27 weeks or more. By 2017, February, the U.S. unemployment had dropped to 4.7%. So, if we go back to in 2009, right when they had, um, when companies went out of businesses and plants closed, the unemployment raised at 10%. And this is basically the second year in Obama's term. By 2017, which is Trump's first year, unemployment had dropped to 4.7%. Now, this is not a drop from one day to the next. The drop was gradually and took the, basically almost 10 years to get to the 4.7%. So causes of unemployment. There's job exportation, which is the relocation of jobs to other countries where products can be produced more cheaply. There's outsourcing, which involves a business subcontracting with a third party to provide business services and it saves companies money as they pay lower salaries and no benefits to those who provide outsourced services. And then there's automation, which is the replacement of human labor with machinery and equipment, which also contributes to unemployment. So automation would be the checkout, the self-checkout that you find at CVS and Target, and even at McDonald's now they have where you can order on a computer. That's what automation is. Um, so outsourcing, for example would be, um, I'm sure this has happened to you, where you call for customer service help and you're talking to somebody um, from another country. And that, and that means that the, the company that you're working with, that, you, that provides whatever service you're calling for, 
um, outsources uh, their customer service reps from other countries. So effects of unemployment on individuals, families, and societies. Unemployment has been linked to depression, low self-esteem, and increased mortality rates. Long-term unemployment can have lasting effects such as an increased debt, diminished retirement and savings account, which are depleted to meet living expenses, home foreclosures, and or relocation from secure housing and communities to unfamiliar places to find a job. So employment concerns of recent college grads. The unemployment rate for young college graduates without an advanced degree and not currently enrolled in further education tends to be more than twice the overall unemployment rate. In 2016, more than 40% of employed college graduates under the age of 25 were working in jobs that did not require a college degree. So this is just basically saying how not even having a bachelor's degree nowadays um, will secure you to land a good job. Um, in fact, it does highlight here that um, students without advanced degrees, an advanced degree would be a master's and a PhD. Back in the day, you were able to find a great job with a bachelor's degree, but now that's kind of moved on to a needing a master's degree. So continuing the problems of work and unemployment, um, there's slavery, which is also known as forced labor, which refers to any work that is performed under the threat of punishment and is undertaken involuntarily. An estimated 435.8 million people throughout the world live in slavery, more than half of whom live in just five countries, which are India, China, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, and Bangladesh. Cattle slavery is an old form of slavery in which slaves are considered property that could be bought and sold. So forced labor in the United States. There are an estimated 5,700 slaves in the United States, most of whom are trafficked into the United States and forced into slavery, most commonly in domestic work, farm labor, and the sex industry. Margaret workers are tricked into working for little or no pay as a means of repaying debts from their transport across the U.S. border, similar to debt bondage in South Asia. So forced labor continues to this day. Um, and we see it primarily in domestic work, farm labor, and in the sex industry. So sweatshop labor is another problem with work and unemployment. It's a work environment that's characterized by less than minimum wage, excessively long hours, unsafe condition, conditions, abusive treatment by employers, and lack of organizations aimed to negotiating better working conditions. So I'm sure that you've heard of sweatshop labor before, and this is where like you kind of hear um, how there is a factory in India making fast fashion, which is stuff like H&M or Forever 21, and how all these garments that are being made in different countries, um, the people that do it work in these sweatshop labors, that many of them have these very characteristics listed in the PowerPoint. Here's a picture depicting the garment industry, which is stuff like I just said, H&M, Forever 21, um, all those fast fashion type of stores. This is um, where many of the people work. So sweatshop labor in the United States. In 2012, the Department of Labor found widespread sweatshop-like labor violations in Los Angeles garment industry. Immigrant farm workers who process 85% of the fruits and vegetables grown in the United States also work under sweatshop conditions. So we still see it here in the United States as well. Another form of work and unemployment problems or problems of work and unemployment is child labor, which involves a child performing work that is hazardous um, and that interferes with the child's education or that harms the child's health or physical, mental, social, or moral development. Child labor is involved in many of the products we buy, wear, use, and eat. Child laborers work long hours with few or no breaks or days off, often in unsafe condition. So this is basically a lot like sweatshop labor, but now this is including children. 
So hundreds of thousands of U.S. child workers, uh, workers labor on um, commercial farms. Child farm workers in the United States are typically of Hispanic origin. Many are U.S. citizens. Girls who work on the U.S. farms are sometimes victims of sexual harassment as well. So here you see a picture of a child um, working in the farm. And not her farm, a person's business farm. So child labor also exists in the United States in restaurants, grocery stores, meatpacking plants, garment factories, and agriculture. Despite federal prohibitions, U.S. youth employed in the service and retail jobs are exposed to harmful conditions and dangerous equipment. So the next problem would be job stress. A Gallup poll found that 29% of respondents are completely or somewhat dissatisfied with the amount of stress in their jobs. Um, so it could be because of a toxic workplace, which is a work environment in which employees are subject to to co-workers and or bosses who engage in a variety of negative stress-inducing behaviors such as intimidation in the workplace or intimidation and workplace bullying, gossiping, and backstabbing. There's also job burnout, which is prolonged job stress that can cause or contribute to high blood pressure, ulcers, headaches, anxiety, depression, and other health problems. So here you can see how job can lead to health problems as well due to the stress and feeling burned out. So the next one would be the work-life conflict. So a major source of stress for the U.S. workers is the day-to-day -day struggle to meet the demands of work and other life responsibilities, including family and education, and simultaneously. Well, including family and education simultaneously. So if you remember, we talked about how a lot of women have gone back to work nowadays, and uh, they go to work, they work nine to five, and then they have that quote-unquote second shift which means that they need to go back home and raise children, cook, clean, or, you know, whatever the case may be, if they have, either are not married or if they have a husband who still believes in the patriarchal um, ideology where women are the ones that deal with these uh, responsibilities. So work-life conflicts are common among U.S. workers. 70% of U.S. women and men report some interference between work and non-work responsibilities. So again, another example can be how you need to uh, work nine to five and you're trying to go to school. That's another life responsibility and trying to juggle all of that. So and the stress that that causes. So I'm sure some of you are in that predicament. Another problem is alienation, which is a condition that results when workers perform repetitive, monotonous um, work tasks and they become estranged from their work, the product they create, other people, and themselves. Alienation has four components, which are powerlessness, meaninglessness, normallessness, and self-estrangement. So when it says like monotonous work task, this is somebody that maybe works in some factory and they work, you know, eight hours a day and it's just doing the same task uh, over and over and over and over. And um, there's no way to, there's no creativity in that work. Um, so they just become like estranged with the product that they create in themselves and like um, kind of um, feel like worthless, if you will. And that's where the, one of the components meaninglessness. meaninglessness. 